And today I'm going to talk about non-osphine fibroma and fibrous dysplasia. Fibrous and fibrosis lesions of bone are quite common and largely benign. And these two entities are the most benign phenomena which we see. In the WHO classification of 2013, two entities lie within the fibrohistiocytic group and both have similar morphological features and they include benign fibrocystocytoma and non-osphine fibroma. Fibrous dysplasia is grouped within a series of other eclectic entities within tumours of undefined neoplastic nature, which are benign. Non-osphine fibroma has three names which reflect its essential aspects. It's fibrous and centred in the cortex, hence the term fibrous cortical defect, and it's located in the metaphysis of the long bones, hence the term metaphyseal fibrous defect. These two terms are usually retained for the smaller variants of the entity. The term non-osophine fibroma is used for the larger variants, and it's from these that we usually receive pathological specimens. These entities occur in individuals who are skeletally immature, and the vast majority of the smaller ones are self-healing. Sometimes they persist into adulthood, such as in this instance, in which a patient who has uh, reached skeletal maturity presented with pain related to the presence of a small stress fracture highlighted in the bottom right MRI. Fibrous cortical defect is the commonest primary bone lesion. Some authors would suggest that if all children were x-rayed completely, about 30% of them would harbour such a lesion in one of their long bones. It's considered to be a developmental anomaly, presents in the first and second decade in individuals with unfused growth plates, and the vast majority of children who present are under two. And not surprisingly, this is usually an incidental finding and is asymptomatic. It is seen in the metaphysis of the long tubular bones in the distal femur, proximal tibia and distal tibia. Fortunately, we rarely see macroscopic or gross specimens of the lesion in situ, but when we do, we would expect that it is centred in the cortex, circumscribed and bordered by a sclerotic rim. And even at this low power, you can see that there is no matrix production within the lesion. So smaller lesions are benign and usually regress because they're self-healing and so treatment is conservative. If the lesions are larger, increasing in size, become painful due to a stress fracture, develop a frank fracture as illustrated on the right, or develop secondary aneurysm or bone cyst, they are treated with curatage. And a curatage specimen will usually include multiple fragments of tissue, which at low power comprises solid lesional tissue. At higher power, we can see uh, a proliferation of fibroblast-like spindle cells within a fibrous stroma arranged in a story-forming architecture. There are irregularly distributed, multinucleated giant cells, and overall, the lesion has a somewhat fibrohistiocytic appearance. The cells are bland with elongated nuclei, vesicular nuclear uh, chromatin, and inconspicuous nucleoli. The giant cells are small, usually singly distributed, and usually only have a, between 5 and 10 nuclei. Clusters of admixed foamy histocytes are common, and these can be quite prevalent, and admixed lymphocytes are seen. Not surprisingly, curatage specimens, therefore, will comprise abundant tan soft tissue with bright yellow areas corresponding with the xanthogranulomatous component. Sometimes we may see areas of necrosis, and this is characteristically seen in association with fracture, and the only giveaway may be the presence of ghost giant cells present in the background. Matrix production or mineralization is not expected except in a setting of fracture in which reactive bone may be seen, and it's very important in these cases to correlate the findings with the imaging and ensure that the radiologist is comfortable with the diagnosis of the lesion and also with the presence of a fracture to explain new bone formation. The term benign fibrocystocytoma is used for an entity which is histologically exactly the same as non-osifying fibroma, but which presents in adults, usually between 30 and 70, at unusual sites, including the flat bones, the ribs, and the non-metaphyseal components of the long bones. Histologically, the changes are exactly the same, and macroscopically, the lesion will be circumscribed with a sclerotic rim, and that will apply both pathologically and radiologically. Multifocal forms of non osmotic fibroma are recognised in a setting of neurofibromatosis type 1 in particular, which encompasses what used to be known as Jaffe-Campanacci syndrome. In this, multiple foci of involvement of the long bones in a symmetrical fashion may be seen, involvement of the axial skeleton may occur, and in the craniofacial bones, the characteristic features are included in that entity known as giant cell lesion. 
these patients often have a variety of other anomalies clinically. The bone lesions usually stabilise after puberty. But it must be remembered that because non-ossifying fibroma is very common, its coexistence with other tumours is well recognised. For example, in this case on the right we have non-ossifying fibroma of the tibia with a sclerotic margin, and on the left we have an aneurysm of bone cyst of the fibula, in which there is an expansile lucent lesion without a sclerotic margin. So the differential diagnosis will include giant cell tumour given the presence of giant cells within the lesion and sometimes indeed giant cell tumour can have areas with a fibrohistiocytic appearance which some authors would suggest is related to regression. However, giant cell tumour is seen in adults, individuals are always skeletally mature or by and large always skeletally mature. The lesion is loosened and well marginated but there is no sclerosis representing the resorption pattern of the giant cells at the edge of the lesion and it's located going to the end of the bone or the subarticular region, something we would not expect to see in a non-ossifying fibroma. Histologically in giant cell tumour, the giant cells are extremely large with numerous central nuclei, often more than 50 and up to 100 nuclei. They have abundant dense cytoplasm which is often vacuolated and usually they're fairly evenly distributed throughout the stroma. The nuclei of the stromal cells, both short, plump and elongated fibroblast-like cells and of the osteoclastic cells are similar. And recently, the presence of specific histone mutations, which are exclusive to giant cell tumour, have been identified. Currently, there is an immunostain, H3GW34, which is available, which shows nuclear expression within the tumour cells of giant cell tumour. It is not seen in the macrophage uh, element, which includes the 30% of monocytes in the background and the giant cells themselves. And this is very useful if you're uncertain. The other entity one must consider in this scenario is solid forms of aneurysm of bone cyst, which in the past was known as giant cell reparative granuloma. We have known for a long time that in aneurysm of bone cyst, solid and cystic areas can be seen. In that entity, histologically or radiologically, the lesions will have more uh, resemblance to cystic forms of aneurysm of bone cysts than they will to non-ossifying fibroma in that they will be lucent and expansile circumscribed without sclerotic margins. They may or may not have fluid fluid levels. Histologically, fibrous stromal tissue is again present in the background and within this there are irregularly distributed clusters of giant cells usually associated with extensive hemorrhage. In addition, intermingled trabeculae of reactive bone will be seen which are usually bordered by plump osteoblasts with admixed osteoclasts. Linear zones of osteoid within the stroma, as one can see here with this pink osteoid material, are commonly present. And the giant cells are unevenly distributed. Often can be seen also protruding into microcystic blood fill spaces, which when it's present is very useful. If we're very lucky, there may be areas of immature fibrochondroid with this peculiar calcification, which is usually seen only in aneurysm, forms of aneurysm of bone cyst. Sometimes it's very difficult to be confident, however, and in these circumstances, testing for USP6 mutation can be helpful, as these will be found in most forms of primary aneurysm of bone cyst. Fibrous dysplasia is a benign medullary fibrosis lesion which can affect one or more bones. If it's one bone, it's known as monostotic. If it's more than one, it's known as polyostotic. In a small percentage of patients, an associated um, um, abnormality known as McCune Albright syndrome may be seen, and we'll discuss that later. In fibrous dysplasia, there are activating mutations of the GS alpha protein or GNAS1 gene. This gives rise to activation or upregulation of cyclic AMP, resulting in increased cellular function. Fibrous dysplasia affects boys and girls equally. Most present as adolescents, although if there is extensive polyostotic disease, they may present at an earlier age. In general, growth of the lesion stops at skeletal maturity. The commonest affected site is the femur, as illustrated on the right, followed by the craniofacial bones, the humerus, ribs, fibula and vertebrae. In polyostotic disease, craniofacial bones are affected in at least 50%, and if the disease is extensive, it's usually always involved. In the polyostotic variant, the involvement can either be along one side of the body when it's known as monomelic involvement, and if it is seen on both sides, it's known as polymelic fibrous dysplasia. 
The characteristic morphology is that of a fibrosis lesion in which immature bone formation is seen within a fibrous stroma, comprising curvilinear trabeculae of bone, which can have a hockey stick appearance, can resemble commas, or have alphabet, alphabet shapes, including Y, C, Ds, and Os in particular. Sometimes the bone formation has this rounded somomatoid or cementoid appearance, and sometimes that can predominate, similar to that of the so-called entity in the jaws known as cementoossifying fibroma. The bone is woven in nature with an inconspicuous osteoblastic lining. The woven bone can be seen on polarization microscopy as collagen fibres arranged like threads in a fabric. Between the bone itself and the surrounding stroma, one can see collagen fibres, known as Sharpie fibres, extending from the stroma into the centre of the woven bone, highlighted on the right in a reticulin strain, and highlighted here on polarisation microscopy at the edge of an area of fibrous dysplasia. These are known as Sharpie fibres. Not infrequently in the stroma, abundant foam cells can be seen, and this can give the tissue a yellowish appearance macroscopically. Fibrous dysplasia is usually circumscribed and delineated by a rim of variably sclerotic bone. So on imaging, it is well circumscribed, centrally located within the medulla, and the sclerotic rim has been likened to a rind, as one sees in an orange. The stroma, with its abnormal bone within a fibrous stroma, gives rise to the classic ground glass appearance on plain film and on CT, and on the top right one sees what ground glass is like, in life and it's very similar to that seen in the image. And this same phenomenon is seen from site to site in this vertebral body and at whatever site one sees fibrous dysplasia. Macroscopically, the fibrous matrix will have a pale appearance predominantly. On sectioning, it often has a gritty texture and in larger bones, it will be confined within the bone and as in this instance, in the acetabulum. In smaller bones, or in bones which have thin cortices, expansion of the bone may occur. So this is common in the craniofacial skeleton, where a very nice example of ground glass appearance with expanded bone and thin cortices are seen, or in other bones such as the ribs. Not surprisingly, therefore, such bones may fracture with relative ease. Usually, fibrous dysplasia merges with the surrounding cortex. But if they are in thin bones and loss of the cortex occurs, they still are quite well circumscribed and confined within the periosteum. Cystic change occurs, and this can reflect either simple cyst formation with serous content or secondary aneurysmal bone cyst. This is an example of a young male who presented with pain, and on this plain film of the chest, one can see an elongated expanded rib with a ground glass matrix. On CT, marked expansion of the rib has occurred. And the patient had intermittent pain, so the rib was excised, and one can see that it has an expanded sausage shape corresponding with the MR on the bottom right. On sectioning, it is composed of fibrous tissue intermingled with hemorrhagic areas, and those are explained by secondary aneurysmal bone cyst formation, which in some circumstances can have overt cystic spaces with uh, blood-filled areas bordered by fibrous septi, and sometimes the aneurysmal bone cyst can have a more subtle appearance, more akin to that of solid aneurysmal bone cyst or giant cell reparative granuloma-like appearance. Indeed, the secondary aneurysmal bone cyst which occurs on the setting of fibrous dysplasia is commonly the reason that patients present, as in this instance in the craniofacial skeleton, where the fibrous dysplasia is highlighted with a white arrow and the aneurysmal bone cyst with a red arrow. Another case in which a young male presented with pain where most of it was related to secondary aneurysmal bone cyst formation on a background of fibrous dysplasia. In secondary aneurysmal bone cyst, we will not expect to see USP6 mutations. Now, one of the problems with biopsies in fibrous dysplasia is that the metaplastic bone which is present is variably distributed. On the right side of the screen, you can see abundant curvilinear trabeculae of bone, but between the arrows there are many less, and if you receive a biopsy from such an area, all you may see is fibrous areas without bone. In the stroma, the cells are usually evenly distributed. They are spindled or stellate in morphology, and sometimes they can be arranged in a slightly interwoven story-forming architecture. It's important in these circumstances to look carefully for subtle metaplastic bone formation, and sometimes you maybe have to do levels for this. Sometimes abundant chyline cartilage can be present, which has 
comprises large lobulated amorphous masses of cartilage, which some authors have called fibrocartilaginous dysplasia. Again, in these circumstances, it's important to look at the surrounding stroma for the characteristic fibroosseous lesion. And on imaging, again, one can see that the lesion is present in a classic location for fibrous dysplasia, and the cartilage is exemplified by those rounded um, ossified or calcified areas corresponding to popcorn-like areas expected with cartilage. So again, the radiologist is your best friend in these circumstances. From time to time, a myxoid stroma may occur and sometimes it will predominate where the fibrous component is relatively inconspicuous. On the right, you can see some metaplastic bone formation. Some authors have used the term liposclerosing fibromyxoid tumour for such lesions, particularly when they occur in the intertrochanteric region of the femur in asymptomatic older males. However, these lesions have been found to harbour GNAS mutations and as such, they form part of the spectrum of fibrous dysplasia. Now, not surprisingly, in extensive fibrous dysplasia, if the bone is involved throughout most of its length, and in a weight-bearing bone in particular, the bone will be suboptimal biomechanically, and therefore de deformity is likely to occur. And in fact, frank fracture is also likely to occur, as is illustrated in this young man who has an intertrochanteric fracture of the femur in a background of a femur which is deformed. And this is the basis for the severe deformity and fracture, which is characteristically described as a shepherd's crook deformity affecting the pelvis. In the craniofacial skeleton, fibrous dysplasia is usually asymptomatic, but it may expand bone and in some cases may cause quite a degree of disfigurement. These patients may ultimately require cosmetic surgery, but this should not be performed until the patient has reached skeletal maturity and the lesion has ceased to grow. One of the problems with the craniofacial skeleton is that the bone which is formed in fibrous dysplasia can be quite thick in nature. It is always circumscribed, as we have discussed before, but it may show a quite a degree of lamellar bone formation and it may show osteoblastic rimming. Again, here, correlation with the imaging is extremely helpful. This will allow you to separate this fibroosseous lesion of the craniofacial bones from the differentials seen in the maxilla and the mandible, the ossifying fibroma, which is an expanding tumor-like mass, often in the maxilla, and from the cementoosseous dysplasia, which is seen in association with the odontogenic apparatus. McCune-Albright syndrome, which is seen in a small percentage of individuals with polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, is characterized by, this, by fibrous dysplasia in association with specific skin pigmentation and endocrine anomalies. Now, if we remember that the um, GNAS1 mutation is an activating mutation, then we will remember that the endocrine anomalies which occur are those of hyperactivity. So we see sexual precocity, hyperthyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, Cushing's disease, and even sometimes gigantism and acromegaly. The bone and skin lesions are usually unilateral, and the skin lesions are those of cafe au lait spots, in which there is an irregular serpiginous border, so-called coast of Maine, because of its irregular margin, in contrast to that of cafe au lait spots seen in neurofibromatosis, where they have a smooth margin um, equivalent to that of the coast of California. These predominate on the trunk. And this is a fairly classic example of a boy with extensive fibrous dysplasia on the right side. He has monomelic fibrous dysplasia and large irregular cafe au lait spots. Another rare association with fibrous dysplasia is that of intramuscular myxoma in the um, syndrome known as Mazabrod syndrome. The myxoma usually overlies the area of fibrous dysplasia. It has all the characteristic morphological features of myxomas elsewhere, but it does harbour the same mutations of the GS alpha gene. From time to time, we may see biopsies from individuals who have a biopsy done for query metastatic disease. This usually occurs because they have an incidental finding after a fall and a bone scan is performed, as in this 54-year-old male who had some discomfort on his back, had a bone scan performed and a biopsy with the question mark query metastasis. But in fact, if you look at the bone scan, you can see that the anomalies are all along the right-hand side of his body. And so this essentially reflects that of polyostotic monomelic fibrous dysplasia.
Not surprisingly, treatment of this, it's a benign entity, is conservative, so monostotic forms are observed. In the polyostotic form, treatment depends on the extent and whether or not there's a propensity to deformity or fracture. So in the weight-bearing bones, they may need internal fixation for straightening and for the prevention of fracture. Fortunately, malignant transformation is extremely rare. Those cases that have been documented occur largely after radiotherapy, and therefore this is now um, not supposed to be performed on anybody with fibrous dysplasia. From time to time, we may see a rare case in which malignant transformation, a benitio, does occur. Now, the differential diagnosis includes non-ossifying fibroma and a variety of other entities, which it is important for us to be aware of. Non-ossifying fibroma, as we have discussed, is centred in the cortex, in contrast to fibrous dysplasia, which is usually centred in the medulla. In non-ossifying fibroma, we have a fibrohistiocytic proliferation with foam and giant cells without bone formation, whereas bone formation is seen in fibrous dysplasia, representing curvilinear trabeculae of metaplastic bone. One of the entities one needs to be aware of is osteofibrous dysplasia. This has had a variety of names over the years, it was originally recognised by Dr. Campanacci in 1976. It is a rare benign fibrosis lesion of childhood, which has a characteristic location in the intracortical region of the anterior diaphysis of the tibia, with rare cases also in the fibula. The vast majority present in the first decade of life, boys more often than girls, and very rare cases are documented in the radius and ulna. In this entity, there are variably distributed curvilinear trabeculae of bone in a fibrous stroma. There appears to be a zoning appearance in most cases. In other words, there are generous bone trabeculae in a looser fibrous stroma at the perimeter of the lesion, and at the centre of the lesion, lesser bone formation is usually seen. The cells have a bland spindled morphology arranged in an interwoven story-forming architecture within a fibrous stroma. And the osseous trabeculae comprise a mixture of both woven and lamellar bone, and they are bordered by plump osteoblasts with admixed osteoclasts. If we apply a cytokeratin stain, we can find individual single cells are stained within the stroma in more than 85% of cases, which is very helpful. Importantly, however, these epithelial cells are never visible on H&E. And these lesions do not have GNAS mutations and therefore do not represent the same phenomenon as fibrous dysplasia. They are distinct and separate from that entity. Radiographically, they present as radiolucent lesions with lobulated and sclerotic margins confined to the cortex. And the typical site is the anterior tibial cortex. Here is a relatively early one. And here is one that is a little bit more advanced. Although it's protruding into the medulla, it is still separated from the medulla by a a dense sclerotic rim. Sometimes multiple foci will be seen, but again they are lobulated with sclerotic margins confined to the cortex. This, in fact, is very similar to the changes one expects to see in adamantinoma. And indeed, we know that this entity has a relationship with adamantinoma. There appears to be a continuum pathologically. However, the exact nature of this relationship remains unclear. There are three entities in which an epithelial and fibrous component is seen. Osteofibrous dysplasia, the rarer entity known as osteofibrous dysplasia like adamantinoma, and classical adamantinoma. In osteofibrous dysplasia, as we have discussed, the cytokeratin positive cells are present, but they are dispersed within the stroma and are not visible on a H&E stain. In osteofibrous dysplasia like adamantinoma, the vast majority of the lesional tissue which is present represents that of a class, fairly classic osteofibrous dysplasia. And there will be a scanty epithelial component noted only and seen on H&E as small nests of cells. These tend to predominate centrally where the curvilinear trabeculae are less prevalent. In adamantinoma, the epithelial cells are clearly visible on H&E. Distinction between these is really important because classical adamantinoma is a malignant tumour and requires resection. The management of osteofibrous dysplasia like adamantinoma has not as yet been clearly elucidated due to the paucity of actual cases. There is an occasional case documented in the literature where progression to frank adamantinoma and metastasis has occurred. So for the moment in childhood, these lesions are managed conservatively awaiting regression. In adulthood, such lesions are curetted 
Examination of all the tissue is important because you need to exclude overt epithelial elements and if they are not identified, it is reasonable to observe such cases closely with imaging and if there is evidence of progression, they should be excised. The next entity that we need to consider in the differential of fibrous dysplasia is low-grade central osteosarcoma. This is the intraosseous equivalent of paraosteal osteosarcoma, although it is much rarer. There are, however, more than 200 cases currently documented in the literature. And although they have been described in practically every bone, the vast majority occur in the long bones and they are mostly present around the knee. As with paraosteal osteosarcoma, they usually comprise immature trabeculae, often of parallel coarse lamellar and woven bone lying within a fibrous stroma without osteoblastic rimming and showing mild nuclear atypia within the component stroma. In bone, however, in contrast to when it's a surface lesion, the changes are diagnostically extremely challenging because of its banal appearance. Here we have one with benign appearing bone mimicking fibrous dysplasia with curvilinear trabeculae. And indeed, it can mimic non ossifying fibroma, forms of solid aneurysm of bone cyst, Paget's disease and desmoplastic fibroma if the osseous component is sparse. So the diagnosis of central low-grade osteosarcoma generally depends on the identification of an, an aggressive growth pattern or a permeative growth pattern either at the margins of the tumour with permeation of host bone or marrow fat, permeation through the cortex or soft tissue extension, none of which is expected in fibrous dysplasia. And this is an example of a fibroosseous lesion which is permeating between the host trabecular bone highlighted with the white arrows. In this case the fibrosseous lesion is permeating into the marrow and it itself is being highlighted by the white arrows. And in this case one can see a fibrosseous lesion in which ongoing layers of osteoid production are present which always should make one think of the possibility of an ongoing growth in an adult in particular. If you're very lucky, you may be, be able to identify small foci of original host lamellar bone which have been practically subsumed by the lesion with a host bone encasement pattern, and this has helped with the polarisation microscopy in particular. Fortunately, in these cases, usually the imaging has concerning features, so while some of the changes may prompt consideration of fibro fibrous dysplasia, there will be something that makes the radiologist concerned, such as in this instance, a soft tissue extension. And in those cases, that is a very helpful sign. This is a young 12-year-old girl who presented with cord compression. She had a biopsy done and had all the appearances, which was perfectly reasonable to suggest it was fibrous dysplasia. But on her imaging, she had very aggressive features. With On CT on the left, you could see sun rays speculation. And on the right, you can see a large soft tissue mass extending into and compressing the cord. And this was, in fact, a low-grade osteosarcoma, which was subsequently confirmed with destruction of the cortex by the lesion and extension into the soft tissues. Now, recent progress has been made in that MDM2 and CDK4 amplification has been identified. We've long recognised this in well-differentiated liposarcomas, but in recent years it has also been confirmed in both paraosteal and low-grade central osteosarcoma. So this is very helpful if you can identify it in the tumour. You must remember, however, that harsh decalcification methods should be avoided in these biopsy specimens in order that um, uh, fish testing can be performed. Which brings us now to desmoplastic fibroma. This is extremely rare and it is analogous to soft tissue fibromatosis but occurring in bone. In the past it has been known as desmoid tumour of bone. It's locally progressive, non-metastasizing. And the vast majority occur in the region of the mandible, in the metaphysis of the long bones, and in the pelvis. In considering the differential with fibrous dysplasia non ossifying fibroma, in desmoplastic fibroma, the fibrosis which is present is fibromatosis like with bland fibroblastic cells and a fibrocollagenous stroma. We don't expect to see foamy histocytes or giant cells. It usually lacks a story forming architecture and bone formation is not expected. And biopsies would show the characteristic features expected in a fibromatosis with bland spindle cells and a background fibrous stroma. Usually, these lesions are reasonably well demarcated macroscopically and on imaging, and they are solid, pale and rubbery, which is not surprising given the morphology. The other entity that may mimic uh, fibrous and fibrosis lesions are those of avulsive or tug lesions, 
These reflect the effects of repetitive forceful traction at tendon, origin and insertion sites, usually seen in young athletic adolescents who are skeletally immature, often around the growth plate or the apophysis. This is such an example in a boy of 13, where the lesion is present at the adductor insertion site in the distal femur. In the past, these lesions were known as periosteal desmoid because histologically they have a florid fibroblastic proliferation and a fibrous stroma mimicking fibromatosis, extending into the accompanying muscle with entrapment of muscle fibres. Uh, for all accounts, similar to that of a fibromatosis. The correct term for this is avulsive cortical irregularity. And again, this emphasises the importance of correlation with the imaging and clinical history. Finally, and fortunately, malignant fibrous tumours and undifferentiated sarcoma of bone are extremely rare. They're seen in the middle-aged and elderly predominantly, and most occur as a secondary phenomenon, often on a background of pagets, after prior radiation therapy, in a setting of bone infarction, as pertains in this macro on the right, or in a setting of dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma. They're most often seen in the metaphysis of the long bones and in the pelvis. Morphologically, we expect to see a fibroblastic tumour exhibiting a permeative growth pattern with extension between and around and entrapment of host bone. At higher power, it has a fibrous appearance and bone resorption of the original trabeculae will be seen, and you may see atypical nuclei. In frank undifferentiated sarcoma, of course, the morphology will be much more aggressive in appearance. Now, it's important to remember that in undifferentiated sarcoma of bone, you must consider other entities, including in particular met metastatic disease from sarcomatoid carcinoma or melanoma, in which case clinical history and immunostains may be of help. Uh, imaging review will help you to discern a lesion arising in association with Paget's disease, dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma, or bone infarction. And the clinical history will help in terms of a background of irradiation or possible pre-existing fibrous dysplasia or other rare familial syndromes. In a younger age group, if you see a fibroblastic or undifferentiated sarcoma of bone, you must consider osteosarcoma. Fibroblastic osteosarcoma is one of the main variants of osteosarcoma. In a biopsy, look for immature osteoid. And if you cannot see immature osteoid, then you must ask the um, radiologist to look for evidence of matrix production on imaging because that will help you to make the diagnosis. Recently, SATB2 immunostain, um, which can be an osteoblastic marker, may help. But the best thing is to look at the imaging. This was a young woman who had a fibroblastic malignant tumour on her biopsy without osteoid production, but clearly on this x-ray we can see she's got matrix production allowing a diagnosis of a fibroblastic osteosarcoma. This young girl had a biopsy showing a fibroblastic undifferentiated sarcoma. On imaging there was no evidence of matrix production. Her SATB2 was negative and ultimately a diagnosis of undifferentiated sarcoma was made. So just to summarise, Fibrous and fibroosseous lesions of bone are common and largely benign, and the commonest are the two entities that we emphasise today, non-ossifying fibroma and fibrous dysplasia. For their main differentials include osteofibrous dysplasia, desmoplastic fibroma and avulsive cortical irregularity, and the malignant forms include low-grade osteosarcoma in particular, but rarely fibrosarcoma and undifferentiated sarcoma. Fortunately for us, the vast majority of these are quite rare. But I think it emphasises the importance of correlating the pathology with the radiology and the clinical background. And in this way, you should be able to reach the appropriate diagnosis in the vast majority of cases. Thank you.